Superman was born Superman. His alter ego is Clark Kent. Clark Kent is how Superman views us, and what are the characteristics of Clark Kent? He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Clark Kent is Superman's critique on the whole human race. Bill from Kill Bill. Ah, so Superman was always dark and nihilistic. Quite the useful insight from Bill, a psychotic assassin who also happens to see humanity as weak and cowardly. Is Superman still relevant today? Arguably a question carrying more weight than one might initially perceive. But to many, possibly even to those who still like and respect the character of Superman, if asked this particular question, the answer would be no. But why exactly? Superman is a character with decades of history, and so has undergone a considerable track of evolution since his first introduction, including a literal change from villain to hero. Like in the reign of the Superman, where Superman was a bald telepathic villain more akin to Lex Luthor than the hero we're familiar with. When Superman is mentioned today, the focus is on what the character has become rather than what he used to be. And this fundamental change of Superman from the simple super to the towering symbol of hope lines up well with the evolution of the Superman crest. While the symbol itself has remained relatively the same, the meaning attached to it has grown significantly more profound. Originally representing a plain S for Superman to the L family crest to, by the time of Superman birthright, a Kryptonian symbol of hope. Therefore, when questioning the relevance of a momentous character like Superman in a more modern society, in a more modern era with more modern values and perspectives, it isn't Superman the villain, or necessarily Superman the hero, but Superman the great symbol of hope to which we often refer. And it's this version of Superman that is all too often defined by his endlessly expanding arsenal of powers and strict ethical code. But as Superman continued to evolve until he was more symbol than man, it became somewhat difficult to see said man behind all the super. And in an era where the Leaders of modern entertainment insist that modern heroes should shift and supposedly reflect the ever-shifting face of the real modern world, there has been a drive to push a more realistic or a more practical spin on modern heroic characters, where light happy tones are replaced by an underlying sense of dread, where optimism is usurped by pessimism and hope is exchanged for cynicism. Suddenly, the smiling Superman is no longer considered relevant, but a naive relic of the past, an icon of a more simplistic bygone age, in the eyes of many current creators. Creators, Superman's utopian views crumble in the face of realism and furthermore, as a character, lacks complexity and therefore also lacks the sophistication modern trends supposedly demand from the modern hero. So, taking all of this into consideration, is the current depiction of Superman, the eternal symbol of hope, the man of tomorrow, the Boy Scout, still relevant in our modern world? Maybe a better question might be that if the concept of Superman were proposed today, i.e. if a Superman existed and another hero with godlike powers were proposed, would he be accepted? The uncomfortable truth is that the answer would still likely be no, or not as easily accepted as Superman himself. But why? Well, one reason might be because despite one's love or hatred of Superman, in some respects our preferences in heroes, just like the character of Superman himself, has evolved over time. A look at the Greek myths, for example, would begin with stories that focused on the personification of primordial entities like Gaia the Earth Mother and her husband Uranus, aka the Sky Daddy. These primordial beings gave birth to the Titans, and the Titans to the Olympian gods, and the Olympian gods to mankind. Well, technically, it was the Titan Prometheus, but it was Zeus who placed the order. From stories about the Earth and the sky who birthed our world, to stories centering around the vile Kronos who devoured his own children out of fear for his own life, the tales of Zeus's constant extramarital affairs and Hera's eternal jealousy, to finally stories of demigods like the labors of Hercules and the rage of Achilles during the Trojan War. Hercules, son of Zeus, king of the Olympian gods, and Achilles, who was granted involvement vulnerability by bathing in the River Styx, the underworld's fabled river of death, there has been a noticeable shift in scope, a blatant move from protagonist who claims literal godhood to those who can only claim half-god status. And as we march closer to the present day, and more importantly, into a world post the introduction of Superman, we've begun to favor mortal men who attain their talents through sheer force of human determination, like John Rambo, Die Hard's John McClane, 24's Jack Bauer, and John Wick. The hero who bleeds has arguably, in some sense, become more prevalent and supposedly more desirable. In essence, we've seemingly moved from a focus on gods to a focus on mortals, the everyman. And keep in mind, there is a lot of weight to the claim that the godlike Superman is far too powerful, especially in a world brimming with people hungry for more complex heroes. The super and Superman, after all, used to amount to being faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, and the ability to leap over very tall buildings in a single bound. Total, no roster of supervisions, no super omnipotent level of super hearing, and no flight. Many of the powers often associated with the character were attached during the 1950s 
40s, stemming from the Adventures of Superman radio drama, and his powers just kept growing forever after. Even in a world filled with time travelers, super scientists, and men who can bend light into objects through sheer force of will, Superman stands unique. For example, one can always look to the age-old rivalry between Superman and the Flash in the legendary contests of speed, a situation where super speed is simply one of Superman's many powers while it remains the Flash's entire claim to fame. And the outcome usually ends in either the Flash winning by the slimmest of margins or Superman proving himself to be the outright faster hero. And while it is true that the Great Man of Steel has a lengthy list of weaknesses, none are really tied to the heart of his powers. If all kryptonite were to vanish, red sun radiation contained, and no magic to be found, Superman would be akin to a god with no readily discernible drawbacks. Superman is always Superman. No blowback from his powers, no time limits, seemingly no limits at all. So, when compared to a character like Deku from My Hero Academia, a fellow noble character who also inherits nigh godlike powers that essentially make him the Superman of his universe, the price he pays is his body. He's certainly one, if not the most powerful hero in its class, but using his power leaves his body shattered and ultimately useless. And this weakness is also technically true for the hero who gifted him these great powers in the first place, his mentor, All Might, the current Superman of the My Hero Academia universe. Though All Might is far more practiced and mature, and could use his Superman-esque powers to their fullest without breaking his body, All Might is still required to have a fully functioning body to maintain it. This is exemplified in the first episode when we discover that All Might's alter ego has suffered very serious permanent damage to his body, and so can only access the power of All Might for a very limited time each day. And that limit permanently decreases should he push himself too far. As we supposedly made the change from gods to quasi-mortal to fully mortal men, the question remains, where does this leave a character like Superman? Is he truly just an overpowered optimistic relic of more optimistic days long past? An optimistic nature that can all too often be overlooked. After all, to some, Superman's primary feature is his tremendous power. It can be easy to forget that Superman's evolution saw him become far more than a simple powerhouse. Just as Superman's iconic S became a sign of hope, the character of Superman too became a shining beacon of morality. His message of wisdom and hope, coupled with his kind and caring nature, are what earned him titles like Man of Tomorrow, the man with steadfast ethics, the man who does the right thing, the man who shows us the way. In short, Superman's strength of arm evolved right alongside the strength of his character, and both have become inseparable defining elements of the iconic hero. But while one can imagine a character with so much strength being a challenge to write for and boring to read, it's possible that the utopian morals of Superman have caused, or at least played a large part in his alleged relevancy. Looking at DC's oversaturation of Harley Quinn along with the popular trend of heroes acting less heroic, one might reasonably argue that modern audiences have evolved. Just as we pulled away from beings with unchallengeable strength, maybe we have also pulled away from beings with seemingly unshakable morals. Perhaps we have become hungry for characters like Harley Quinn over the ethical monolith of Superman. Perhaps the idea of Superman has passed its prime and is now viewed as a mere indulgence of severe naivete. And perhaps this is the reason why we're seeing a new shift from traditionally virtuous and morally incorruptible heroes to outright villains. Or more specifically, characters who display actions, motivations, and characteristics normally attributed to villains. After all, this pattern seems to coincide with the assertions made by the lords of modern media. Assertions that a modern entertainment-seeking populace seeks entertainment starring dark, flawed, and morally ambiguous heroes, often drenched in gratuitous nihilism and juvenile levels of cynicism. AKA the usual heroes, but with the light switched off, and a lot more crying, murder, and no-no words. From DC's sad puppy dog obsession with Harley Quinn, gleefully transforming her from sympathetic psychopath to psychopathic symbol of female empowerment, to the infamous scene depicting the alleged hero, Captain Marvel, breaking a man's hand and stealing his motorcycle because he asked her to smile, or the stunning and brave Marvel Voices comic depicting She-Hulk breaking a man from a prison truck, injuring the innocent driver, all so the prisoner's victim could indulge in revenge rather than settle for justice. And that succinctly summarizes the overall change. Instead of a shift in scope as we saw in our move from God to man, it's a shift in morals, a change of emphasis from justice to revenge. In the words of Zack Snyder, the man who so proudly screeched the movie Batman v Superman, Ben Netflix Batman killed a guy. I'm like, really? Wake up. It's a cool point of view to be like, my heroes are still innocent. My heroes didn't lie to America. My heroes didn't commit any atrocities. That's cool, but you're living in a dream world. There are few better examples of the previously described moral shift than the portrayal of Batman in Zack Snyder's murderverse. A portrayal that has fostered
fostered its own infamy by making murder a heroic virtue, or at least a glorified vice. In Snyder's Batman v Superman, Bruce Wayne has grown to middle age, and in a similar way to Snyder's desire for his audience to wake the FUD up, Bruce Wayne likewise has woken up to the same dark reality Snyder wished to drop on his audience, a Sweeney Todd-like epiphany without the delightful song. To quote, 20 years in Gotham, Alfred, we've seen what promises are worth, how many good guys are left, how many stay that way, referring to his loss of faith and shattering of his heroic delusions, and of course, if there's a 1% chance he is our enemy, we have to take it as an absolute certainty. This last line in particular, feeding into what seems to be the philosophy of Zack Snyder's murderverse, blatantly showing the audience that Bruce Wayne has indeed succumbed to the dark reality of the world, and just like Captain Marvel and She-Hulk, has cast aside his crusade for justice, for one of vengeance. Batman's murder spree shows us that he no longer grants criminals the benefit of the doubt, and just like the smile of Superman, long gone is Batman's dedication to life in the hopes of saving both the innocent from the criminals, and the criminals from themselves. Snyder's Bruce Wayne is one steeped in darkness and cynicism, a version of Bruce Wayne who, by Zack Snyder's own words, has woken up from the dream world, where heroes are still innocent, where they didn't lie or embezzle or commit atrocities. To quote, There was a time above, a time before. There are perfect things, diamond absolutes, but things fall, things on earth, and what falls is fallen. In the dream, they took me into the light. A beautiful lie. A reference to Bruce Wayne's dream where he's lifted from the dark and into the light by bats. In other words, in his dream world, Bruce doesn't have to be alone. There is meaning and friendship in his fantasy. There he can always believe. There will be those who can carry him when he falls. But it's his waking world, the real world, that leads him to a harsher reality. One devoid of meaning, friendship, and heroism. Throughout both Snyder's Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, Superman is often revered as a Christ-like figure, and as Superman writhes on the ground struggling to breathe inside a kryptonite fart cloud, we can almost hear Zack Snyder's words echo in Batman's voice when he belittles the great symbol of hope. You're not brave. Men are brave. And so, by the time we get to the final confrontation, we see Superman lying helpless and Batman dragging the hero off to certain destruction. I bet your parents taught you that you mean something. That you're here for a reason. My parents taught me a different lesson. Dying in the gutter for no reason at all. We see that in the contest of man versus god, it's the mortal man who wins. But whether you approve of the movie's quality and its peculiar direction, the question remains, is Zack Snyder ultimately correct? Is this noticeable shift away from the ideals of the the idealistic Superman a sign of maturation? Have we, in fact, moved past the great heroic paragons of virtue in favor of gaudy grumps and capes? That the idea of the great modern hero is less of a Superman and more of a morally ambiguous vigilante. So we get a Batman who kills, we get a Superman who trashes trucks in emotional fits of rage, we get a Captain Marvel who threatens to steal from people she does not like, and we have a She-Hulk who breaks a prisoner out of jail so her client can get revenge, because justice just wasn't good enough. But are these darker depictions of our modern-day superheroes really what we wanted. As odd as it might sound, just as Superman's traditional heroism potentially makes him irrelevant as a modern hero, Quinn's traditional villainy goes a long way to granting her the coveted status of modern-day role model. But maybe not so odd would put within the context of the cinematic depiction of Captain Marvel, who is portrayed as heroic or in the right, when she stole a man's motorcycle for telling her to smile. Or She-Hulk, who was also portrayed as in the right, when she freed a lawfully jailed prisoner so her her client could deliver unlawful retribution. But do anti-heroes and villains truly have more substance than traditional heroes? Are they more complex, less naive, more mature? Are they more narratively significant than characters like Superman? And is this why so many mainstream creators and works have tossed aside traditional heroism in favor of the morally ambiguous? And if this is the case, if we've actually moved past traditional heroism tossed Superman into irrelevancy, the next obvious question is why? Well, let's hear the proposed reason directly from the the mainstream creatives themselves, the same creatives who have creative control over many current year American superheroes. During an episode of the Women of Marvel podcast, a group of comic book professionals got together to discuss their experiences in comics. This particular panel consisted of Sana Amanad, Vida Ayala, Tini Howard, and Leia Williams. And over the course of the episode, the panelists begin to echo the same ideas behind the aforementioned cultural shift. To quote Tini Howard, I also love how you brought up a villain, because that's something I laugh about a lot. Like when the people bring up the very 
valid like academic discourses about queer coding and villainy. But at the same time, I'm like, I identify with villains. Just like Zack Snyder, the panelists continue to voice their preference for anti-heroes and villains over traditional heroes. Another panelist, for example, would expand on the topic by pointing out the additional attention, focus, and development many villains have gotten in recent years. Very rarely today do we have a villain that is just cookie cutter. It's like, oh, you were traumatized and abused. As mentioned earlier, this moral and cultural shift has not gone unnoticed by creatives at large, but it isn't until the panel gets into why that we get a real insight into how those who control the heroes in the mainstream media actually see our heroes. I feel that we identify with villains because of their struggle. Very rarely today do we have a villain that is just cookie cutter. It's like, oh, you were traumatized and abused, and you were like, I'm going to reflect that back. Oh, I would never do that, but I feel that real deep. It would be a catharsis. Another panelist would add, we find something instantly recognizable in these characters that are queer-coded and vilified, specifically and are misunderstood by everyone around them, even if we don't consciously know why we're drawn to these characters. It's kind of an experience that is recognizable, but perhaps the most telling and possibly the most damning comment of all went as follows. And for a long time too, with villain characters, just in general, not specific to Marvel, they also had a lot of room, just not to be queer, but just to do things that were a little more nuanced and complicated than the cookie cutter hero characters because you get all this pressure for the hero to kind of stay in one lane, because that's the moral character and the moral center of the story. Whereas with the villain, it's like, no, you can have moments of softness and moments of doubt, and all of these things, and then you're still the villain. And this comment on villains became more significant when we switch from their perspective on villains to their perspective on heroes. I would rather see that story, i.e. a villain story, than the one where the person is like, hi, I'm a good person, and that's it. I'm going to punch the bad guy. And there we have it, right from the ladies of modern media. Maybe it is the struggle of the anti-hero, the struggle of the villain, that ultimately attracts our attention, especially when opposed to characters like Superman. As the panel put it, cookie cutter good guys who just punch the complex bad guy. Maybe it is the outcast nature that speaks to our modern sensibilities and allows us to relate with these tragically flawed beings rather than the perfectly moral paragon of Superman. Maybe it is that same flawed nature that leads us to prefer anti-heroes and villains because they better mirror the glaring imperfections in the real world. Because here, heroes aren't perfect. There are no perfect paragons of virtue. There are no superheroes. As Snyder put it, in the real world, our heroes are liars and embezzlers. Maybe the traditional heroes of yesteryear were born out of cultural naivete from a far brighter and optimistic time. Maybe we finally realize that Superman's ethical utopia is an impossibility. The stuff of mere dreams. And maybe we have woken from that dream world where our heroes are still innocent. And maybe we have indeed outgrown the man of tomorrow. Or maybe it all hinges on something else entirely. Earlier, the question was asked if the concept of Superman were proposed today, would he be accepted? Maybe he still wouldn't be. However, maybe Superman wouldn't be accepted today, not because we've outgrown him, but specifically because Superman with both his powers and ethics combined has already become so iconic. Maybe that's the reason why he's been so continuously copied, cloned, and parodied, because he's the foundation for the very idea of the superhero and that the makeup of his character defined the entire genre itself. And maybe these modern day creators who have lost faith in heroes and revere villains have no idea what they're talking about. So, is Superman still relevant today? Let's look at it from another angle, shall we? Superman is too powerful. Superman is unrealistic. Superman isn't cool. Superman is just a naive Boy Scout. These are the kind of responses one might receive when one brings up the idea of Superman as a character and more importantly, as a hero. As the women of Marvel pointed out, we've apparently gravitated towards villains because we identify with their struggle. After all, how can a man like Superman, a man with seemingly no limits, struggle at all? He is the man who has everything you know. Because the women of Marvel were in fact correct about one particularly important issue. That despite humanity's assorted differences and regardless of culture or era, we are universally attracted to the struggling hero. And this struggle makes up the core of Joseph Campbell's monomyth, perhaps better known as the hero's journey. The young would-be adventurer begins as a normal person. That person then struggles past the threshold guardian, endures the tests of the mentor, defies temptation into evil, traverses the abyss, and returns transformed as a hero. So when the pilgrim finally returns home, he can pass on his wisdom gained through these various trials to the next generation. And while this journey doesn't 
always fit every story perfectly. It exists because Campbell saw narrative patterns that existed in myths, legends, and stories from around the world. So when the women of Marvel say, I feel that we identify with villains because of their struggle, that part is true. Whether you are watching a testosterone pumping action film or reading a romance novel, our need to see protagonists struggle and face down challenges is arguably the narrative foundation for any story. However, one thing that seems to have been utterly forgotten is the reason Joseph Campbell's monomyth became better known as the hero's journey. So while it is true that villains do struggle, if we take a closer look, the reason given to us by the women of Marvel and even Zack Snyder makes no sense at all. And the likely possible reason why so many mainstream creatives have replaced traditional heroes with the anti-hero and the villain is far more disturbing. But what is a hero to begin with? According to the Greek philosopher Plato, a hero practiced what he called the four cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. Prudence, the ability to discern the correct course of action in each situation at just the right time. Temperance, the practice of self-control and moderation. Justice, having a strong sense of fairness. Fortitude, endurance, the strength to carry out the other virtues, the ability to confront fear, uncertainty, and intimidation. Let's jump back to the earlier example of My Hero Academia. As mentioned before, Superman is a hero of nigh limitless power, power which seemingly comes with no direct cost. In a place devoid of his roster of weaknesses, there is no price he must pay to fuel his abilities. And as mentioned before, this is opposed to characters like Deku and All Might, who are limited by their physical well-being or suffer under time limits. But the story of My Hero Academia, just like the story of Superman, isn't really one about power. The true narrative is about the nature of heroism, and not only is the idea of heroism versus power acknowledged by the show, Show, it's a core element of the story. Episode 1 gives us a world obsessed with powerful heroes. Deku is a boy equally obsessed with becoming a great hero. The catch is, he is completely powerless. Even in a world where super abilities are extremely common, Deku has not one superpower to his name. Before long, the supernatural became the totally normal. Dreams, a reality. The world became a superhuman society with about 80% of the population possessing some uncanny ability. Deku's rival, Katsuki Bakugo is a fitting personification of the societal status quo. Power is generally emphasized while heroism is celebrated but isn't necessarily required. Bakugo is powerful, he's smart, confident, and skilled. And out of his entire class, he is the one student expected to graduate on to UA, the most prestigious hero academy in Japan. Quite an accomplishment, especially given its 0.2% acceptance rating. As a result, he's the most celebrated and respected student in his class. However, Bakugo isn't what one might imagine when one might imagine a hero. He's shamelessly prideful, crossing the line into hubris. He's self-absorbed, violent, and cruel. He's everything Deku isn't. To quote, Don't let me in with this bunch of losers. I'm the real deal. But these guys will be lucky if they end up sidekicks to some busted D-lister. And it's this comparison we can make between Deku and Bakugo that speaks to the true message of the work. Deku begins his journey at the lowest rung on the social ladder. He's powerless. He lacks confidence. He is constantly mocked and laughed at. Deku Deku is lacking in every way Bakugo is not. In the eyes of society, without a quirk, he is virtually worthless. All men are not created equal. This was the reality I learned about society at the young age of four, and that was my first and last setback. Yet, despite his severe lack of power and inexperience, by the end of the first season, Deku displays every single one of Plato's cardinal virtues. We can see hints of this right from episode one. In the world of My Hero Academia, the path of a superhero is a quick path to money and fame. The greatest, most popular, most effective heroes receive the most praise and, more importantly, the most money. So those wanting to be heroes aren't necessarily walking the path of the greater good. This attitude aligns well with the attitude of the My Hero Academia universe. Power, fame, and money have far overshadowed truth justice, and sacrifice. And once again, we see this painted perfectly when we focus on how the character of Bakugo and the character of Deku react to the hero All Might. To quote Bakugo, I'll end up more popular than All Might himself and be the richest hero of all time. People all across the world will know who I am. When Bakugo looks at All Might, he doesn't see an icon of heroism. Instead, he sees a powerhouse swimming in fortune and fame. It becomes clear that Bakugo has been seduced by the shining allure of wealth rather than the painful burden of sacrifice. His motivation is selfishness rather than selflessness. While All Might is powerful, popular, and rich, Deku's focus rests elsewhere. Ever since I was a kid, I thought that saving people was the coolest thing you can do. I want people to see my fearless smile and feel safe and be the kind of hero everyone in the world looks up to, just like 
All Might. Both admire All Might. However, Bakugo admires what the hero has earned, while Deku admires what the hero represents. Superman is the man who does the right thing. All Might is the man who smiles in the face of death. Oh, and keep these little facts in mind. We'll be coming back to them in a bit. Deku's most notable virtue is fortitude. The ability to confront fear, uncertainty, and intimidation. Having the endurance to keep going even when all hope is lost. As mentioned, Deku's lifelong dream is, inspired by the heroism of All Might, to become a hero. Hero. However, fate has made this goal a glaring impossibility. Yet, Deku perseveres, believing in his dream even when everyone tells him it's hopeless. From the doctor informing Deku that his dream is medically unobtainable, to his peers who constantly mock him, to Bakugo who bullies him, to his mother who denied support, to even the great All Might himself. When Deku asks All Might if a quirkless kid could ever become a hero, All Might responds, not without a quirk. An answer that echoes back to the prevailing idealization of power and glamour showing us that even the noble All Might, to at least some degree, has fallen to this worldview. Deku, despite having his childhood dream crushed by his idol, still pushed through all that pain and stepped in to save Bakugo when he was captured by a monstrous villain, knowing full well he stood no chance of winning. Sometimes I do feel like I'm a failure, like there's no hope for me, but even so, I'm not going to give up, ever. And this hints to Deku's second strongest cardinal virtue, justice, also known as a strong sense of fairness. Bakugo is selfish, arrogant, and cruel, and Deku has been the primary target of the most vicious instances of Bakugo's ire, all culminating in Bakugo ruthlessly mocking Deku, burning his most cherished possession at the time, and urging Deku to end his own life. While a normal person might hold a grudge and leave their bully to die, Deku saw Bakugo as a person in peril and attempted to save the life of his tormentor. And Deku would show similar concern for Ochiko Yuraraka when she became the target of a giant robot during the UA entry exam. Although Yuraraka and Deku had briefly met beforehand, she was nonetheless a complete stranger. As far as Deku knew, he faced the choice of either leaving Yuraraka to fend for herself and possibly passing the exam or saving her, likely forfeiting any chance of getting into UA and sacrificing his dream. Yet, just like he did for Bakugo, again, Deku put everything on the line to save someone in peril. And this leads to the next cardinal virtue, prudence. From very early on, Deku has displayed a natural talent for knowing exactly what needs to be done. When he tried to rescue Bakugo, his actions ultimately failed. But remember when I mentioned that All Might had fallen to the prevailing worldview? While Deku couldn't rescue anyone, his selfless actions inspired All Might to step in when he otherwise would not have, meaning Deku's words and deeds were exactly what All Might needed to rediscover his heroic spirit. If you hadn't told me about your life, if you hadn't run into that fight, I would have been a worthless bystander watching from the crowd. Deku may not have saved the day, but his heroic actions inspired the man who did. And again, when he rescued Yuraraka, he chose the correct course of action, both to save someone and to pass the exam. Deku may not have known how to pass like a typical UA student, he may not have known how to save the day, but he knew exactly what to do when circumstances demanded that he act like a hero. This all culminated into Deku developing a plan that led himself and two other heroes to victory over an overwhelming group of invading villains. Now we come to Temperance. Deku is a naturally heroic character, but that doesn't mean he lacks flaws. Temperance is something Deku tends to struggle with right from the very beginning. In short, Deku is overindulgent. We get our first hint of this during his initial training with All Might, where he becomes so obsessed with inheriting All Might's power that he constantly overworked himself. You're overworked. The aim to pass American Dream Plan was created with your body in mind. It was fine-tuned to ensure your progress was swift but manageable, which means you haven't been sticking to it. You're overdoing things. That's going to have the opposite effect of what we want. However, this flaw isn't forgotten. In fact, many of Deku's major trials become tests of temperance. Perhaps one of the most critical was a test presented by his homeroom teacher, Mr. Aizawa, specifically during the pitch test, where each student was to throw a ball as far as they could. Keep in mind that at this point, Deku's power is all or nothing. Deku's nature is to put his all into everything he does. No attempt at moderation. Unfortunately for this reason, using his power leaves his body broken and useless after just one use. And so, on his first attempt at the pitch test, Deku planned to break his entire body in order to dominate the test while failing the following ones. It's here that Aizawa steps in. In the past, there was an oppressively passionate hero who saved over a thousand people by himself and created a legend. Even if you have the same reckless valor, you'll just be decked and turned into a useless doll after saving one person. Izuku Midoriya, with your power, you can't become a hero. I'm Aizawa. 
Aizawa points out that Deku would be useless in any practical battle. One use of his power and his body becomes worthless. So, either Deku immediately learned to moderate his power, or he would be summarily expelled. Deku ends up succeeding, passing the test while only sacrificing his finger instead of his body. So, despite struggling with moderation, when it came to a test when it mattered the most, Deku still successfully displayed the cardinal virtue of temperance. But what does this have to do with Superman and how relevant he is today? Why go over the virtues of Deku at all? Because Deku's character, his journey, and the world of My Hero Academia show us precisely why Superman is so important. Then the women of Marvel, who are, as a reminder, some of the people in charge of defining the modern superhero discuss how they identify with villains because of their struggle, how they would rather see the villain's story over the alleged two-dimensional heroes who just arrived to punch the bad guy, or claiming that villains have more room for nuance and complexity than the so-called typical cookie-cutter heroes because said heroes must always, quote, stay in one lane. All these assertions seemingly insinuate that heroes don't struggle, and that they definitely don't struggle like villains do. And this, of course, is absolute nonsense. Heroes face the same temptations and can even suffer the same circumstances as villains, but heroes don't fall prey to them. Fortitude, justice, prudence, temperance. These elements form the makeup of a hero, the traditional cardinal virtues. But why would a hero require these virtues to begin with? Why would a hero require the fortitude to endure pain and hardship? Why would a hero require a sense of fairness strong enough to differentiate the ideals of justice from revenge? Why would a hero require the prudence to determine the correct course of action? And why would a hero require the temperance to maintain careful self-control? Because what seems to have been forgotten by the wonderful women of Marvel, and is perfectly illustrated treated by the journey of Noble Deku, is that heroes struggle too. Remember when I said that while Bakugo admired the wealth that heroes earned, Deku admired what heroes stood for? The main lesson we see throughout My Hero Academia, through both the characters of All Might and Deku, is that above all else, the purpose of a hero is to inspire those around them, and that it isn't the level of their power, nor the number of abilities that capture our adoration. It is ultimately the hero's struggle that inspires us. To see them defy temptation when most of us would give in, see them push forward when most of us would run, see them act when the rest of us would hide, see them eagerly sacrifice what the rest of us would never surrender, to see them show mercy when the rest of us might return cruelty with cruelty, willingly take pain upon themselves, show bravery despite their own overwhelming fear. In the words of All Might, I'm the guy who's always smiling, right? I'm the symbol of peace. People everywhere have to think that I'm never afraid. But honestly, I smile to hide the fear inside. It's just a brave face I put on when the pressure is high. It was All Might's unshakable confidence and bravery that inspired Deku to become a hero. I made a decision that day. No matter what anyone else thinks, I have to believe in myself. And I'll keep smiling, just like him. And ever since I was a kid, I thought that saving people is the coolest thing you can do. I want people to see my fearless smile and feel safe and be the kind of hero everyone in the world looks up to, just like All Might. And when All Might lost his way, it was Deku's selfless attempt to rescue Bakugo that inspired All Might to remember his purpose as a hero once again. And of course, it was Deku's selflessness and his heroic nature that convinced All Might to choose a quirkless nobody to inherit his more than considerable power. Young man, you too can become a hero. So whether it be Deku or All Might or even Superman himself, the question was never about a measure of strength, but what the character does with that strength. Deku is just a modern take on the age-old heroic journey, the latest face on a hero with a thousand faces. The journey of Deku, at its core, shows us the same lesson we see in the journey of Superman. That power does not make one a worthy hero. It is a hero that makes himself worthy of his power. And that philosophy forms the heart and soul of Superman's eternal struggle. To put the struggle another way, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are almost always bad men. John Emmerich, Edward Dahlberg Acton. Superman faces the same temptations we do, but like the ideal hero, he doesn't allow himself to fall prey to them. Superman is often criticized for his seemingly limitless nature. He's practically the embodiment of absolute power. However, it's precisely this lack of clear physical limitations that paint the character as the eternal hero personified. While any character can possess overwhelming power, especially in a superhero universe, Superman stands unique as the rare example of one who indeed possesses boundless strength while remaining morally incorruptible. But this moral incorruptible 
incorruptibility isn't easy. Superman is a man who constantly faces the burden of his own magnificence. In other words, his struggle is a never-ending battle against temptation. In the immortal words of Plato, for a man to conquer himself is the first and noblest of all victories. And the reason why Superman can face down a legion of mad scientists, monsters, and aliens on a daily basis and still refrain from letting the idea of what he can do overtake the idea of what he should do is because just like Deku, Superman displays all four of Plato's cardinal virtues. And there are very few better examples that explore the heroic nature of Superman and the colossal scope of his character than Grant Morrison's all-star Superman. While the work is a passionate love letter to the beloved hero, the overarching story is built from a series of smaller adventures, each one revolving around a legendary challenge, each of which serves to highlight the heroism of Superman. A good hero possesses the fortitude to confront fear, uncertainty, and stand courageous against intimidation. In the All-Star storyline, Superman is destined to perform 12 labors before his death. Superman saves the first man mission to the sun. Superman brews the super elixir. Superman answers the unanswerable question. Superman chains the coronavore. Superman saves Earth from Bizarro Home. Superman returns from the Underverse. Superman creates life. Superman liberates the city of Kandor. Superman defeats Solaris. Superman conquers death. Superman builds an artificial heart for the sun. Superman leaves the recipe to make Superman 2. Twelve tasks so momentous that only a man like Superman could have the fortitude, the strength, to confront the fear, uncertainty, and intimidation of overcoming such challenges, all while facing down the most terrifying uncertainty of all, his own mortality. Or as Hamlet called it, the undiscovered country. But to quote Superman, I see it like tiny fireworks below my skin. At least this explains the weird bioelectric discharges. What a bizarre irony if the source of my powers winds up killing me, but everything else has failed. Time and time time again, Superman is faced with obstacles believed impossible by those around him. Obstacles that would be physically or emotionally crushing for anyone, yet Superman still possessed the fortitude to fly into the unknown against impossible odds and succeed every time. A prudent hero possesses the ability to discern the best course of action to be taken and when to take that action. In other words, the prudent hero can arrive at the correct answer when most could not, and in a time frame most could never make. Superman answering what's called the unanswerable question being one of the most notable tests of his prudence. When Lois Lane is captured by the Ultra Sphinx, the only way to save her life is to answer a question so difficult that answering it correctly is historically counted as a labor on the same level as defeating a monster that eats time and conquering death. To reiterate, Superman faced a challenge deemed in canon to be virtually unsolvable, and with Lois Lane's life on the line, with the pressure mounting, his practiced sense of prudence still guided him to victory. In comparison, let's see how Zack Snyder's Superman handles his loved ones being held hostage. Haha, <laughs> I have your mother. I'm gonna kill you. Oh, a just hero possesses a powerful sense of fairness, one that takes precedence even over their own feelings. The just hero is principled and strives to hold those principles over any need for personal satisfaction. They strive to do what they believe to be the right thing. As mentioned, the all-star storyline follows a slowly dying Superman as he attempts to leave the world a better place after his passing. But it was Superman's most infamous enemy, Lex Luthor, that sparked the hero's demise by causing Superman to be oversaturated with solar radiation. To quote, Your trip to the sun exposed you to critical levels of stellar radiation, more raw energy than your cells are able to process efficiently. Apoptosis has begun. Cell death. There can be only one outcome, even for you, Leo Quintum. While most people might want revenge on their killer before they met their end, Superman did not. Instead, the hero ended up saving his killer's life several times when Superman, as Clark Kent, visited Lex Luthor in prison for an interview. Why? Because even after all the evil Luthor had done, even after orchestrating his death, Superman still believed in the potential good of his arch enemy. To quote Superman, I'm dying. The world is yours. At least for the three weeks you have left before they execute you. It's not too late to put that brilliant mind to work. Lex, I know there's good in you. Superman could end Lex Luthor's life in an instant, and no one could stop him. But to Superman, that wouldn't be just. To Superman, everyone deserves a chance to change, a chance to choose for themselves. To Superman, it's never too late to believe in the goodness of others, even when they have fallen as far as Lex Luthor. The temperate hero respects the virtues of moderation, discipline, and sacrifice. Superman's constant challenge is to maintain control of his powers, and by extension, keeping 
control of his emotions. Should Superman lose control, he could easily become a man who would use his power for his own selfish ends. Stop showing the world the way toward ethical utopia and start bending the world to his will. Over the course of the All-Star storyline, Superman dies when Lex Luthor ingests an elixir that gives him the same powers as Superman for 24 hours. Luthor, of course, immediately begins conquering Metropolis unchallenged. With his friends in mortal peril, Superman sacrifices the paradise of the afterlife. He sat face to face with everything he ever wanted and rejected the offer, instead choosing life and conquering death. When Superman returns to life, he is greeted by a super-powered Lex Luthor, who by this time had killed Superman twice, is threatening his friends, and has already schemed his way out of the death penalty. And Superman may have momentarily conquered death, but he was still dying. Superman should be angry. Perhaps a normal person would see only two options. To fight Lex Luthor into submission despite knowing that all of this could happen again, except you wouldn't be there to save the day. Or compromise your principles and kill Lex Luthor, making sure something like this never happens happened again. Essentially giving us a similar outcome to the final fight between Batman and the Joker in Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, an instance where Batman finally loses control and breaks the Joker's neck. But that isn't what happened. Superman ultimately wins by defeating Luthor's villainy. It appears as if Superman was trying to conquer Luthor with a gravity gun. In reality, Superman used the gravity gun to manipulate time, causing Luthor to burn through the elixir much faster. But this wasn't the real victory. The elixir boosted Luthor's senses so significantly he could see past the strength and the laser vision and really began to understand what Superman sees every day. To quote Luthor, It's so obvious. I can actually see and hear and feel and taste it and the fundamental forces are all yoked by thought alone. I can actually see the machinery and wire connecting and separating everything since it all began. And through tears, Luthor explains how Superman sees the world. This is how he sees all the time, every day, like it's all just us in here together, and we're all we've got. So after Luthor finished his Hunter S. Thompson style epiphany, nearly all fight vanishes from the villain. Even Luthor seemed to find some closure in the face of the renewed global calls for his execution. He seemed so faded, so small, now that he finally got his dearest wish. Leo Quintum, even with everything on the line, when emotions were high and the stakes even higher, when Superman went head to head with the man who killed him twice, who threatened everything he loved, who the entire world deemed worthy of death, he still kept his emotions in check. Superman still possessed the discipline to choose the righteous path. So when John Emmerich says, great men are almost always bad men, Superman proves that he is the rare man with the moral fortitude, temperance, prudence, and profound sense of justice to reject the corruption that often plagues those with absolute power. Why? Because Superman is not just a hero, he's the personification of the archetypical hero. Anyone remember the hero's journey? One major element of Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, the book that formed his famous monomyth, was the idea of archetypes. Archetypes were explained in depth by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. For example, two recognizable archetypes one might see in the hero's journey are the sage slash mentor figure who bestows wisdom on the hero, like Yoda to Luke Skywalker, and the lover who inspires love within the hero, like the princess to Luke Skywalker. But while Campbell merely adopted the archetypes, Carl Jung was born in them. To quote from the archetypes in the collective unconscious, there are as many archetypes as there are typical situations in life. Endless repetition has engraved these experiences into our psychic constitution, not only in the forms of images filled with content, but at first only as forms without content, representing merely the possibility of a certain type of perception and action. The ruler, the artist, the rebel, the jester, the innocent, are all other common archetypes one might see in story and myth. But let us simplify this down to the archetype most important to the character of Superman, which is, of course, the hero. The hero represents our need to overcome obstacles and achieve goals. As described by Carl Jung, only one who has risked the fight with the dragon and is not overcome come by it wins the horde, the treasure hard to attain. These archetypes tend to be heavily associated with the hero's journey. But just like Campbell's monomyth, said archetypes and the symbols that represent them were universal, all of them present in one way or another throughout history and regardless of cultural boundaries. In the words of Joseph Campbell, whether we listen with aloof amusement to the dreamlike mumbo jumbo of some red-eyed witch doctor of the Congo, or read with cultivated rapture thin translations from the sonnets of the mystic Lao Tzu, now and again crack the hard nutshell of the argument of Aquinas. Or 
or catch suddenly the shining meaning of a bizarre Eskimo fairy tale. It will be always the one shape-shifting yet marvelously constant story. So, what does this all mean? It means that the idea of the hero exists universally across the world and universally across every age of human existence. In other words, as long as humans have been alive, there have been heroes. To again quote Joseph Campbell, throughout the inhabited world, in all times and under every circumstance, the myths of man have flourished. But where specifically does the hero archetype come from? While stories and myth might be where archetypes tend to manifest, they actually come from our unconscious mind, or as Carl Jung titled it, the collective unconscious. The idea of the collective unconscious answers the inevitable question, how can archetypes be universal? How can two storytellers from two different cultures and two completely different eras share so many similarities or have such similar views of heroism? Essentially, the collective unconscious is composed of elements which are inherited and which all humans share. As described by Jung, we can also find unconscious qualities that are not individually acquired but are inherited, e.g. instincts as impulses to carry out actions from necessity without conscious motivation. In this deeper stratum, we find archetypes. The instincts and archetypes together form the collective unconscious. I call them collective because unlike personal unconscious, it is not made up of individual contents, but of those which are universal and of regular occurrence. And according to Jungian analyst Anthony Stevens, thus, on appropriate occasions, archetypes give rise to similar thoughts, images, mythologies, feelings, and ideas in people irrespective of their class, creed, race, geographical location, or historical epoch. Archetypes are patterns humanity has developed through universally shared experiences. For example, we've all had teachers or a mentor in some form. And when you think of a teacher, what kind of image comes to mind? An old man with a beard? Someone sporting a coat with elbow patches? Images for teachers can manifest in a variety of ways. Stern, absent-minded, naughty. One archetype, a thousand different images. A thousand faces, you might say. And every single image is linked together by one trait, wisdom. Because everyone from the ancient caveman to the medieval European blacksmith to the modern fast food employee required knowledge to do their job and a mentor to teach them. Ray. And just as the mentor ties back to our need for knowledge, within both dreams and stories, the hero represents our need for mastery. To yet again reference Young, the hero's main feat is to overcome the monster of darkness. It is the long hoped for and expected triumph of consciousness over the unconscious. Just as the lover is symbolic of our need for intimacy, like Lois Lane to Superman, the hero symbolizes our need to master skills. Our need need to, much like Superman, develop the necessary abilities to overcome otherwise terrifying and daunting obstacles. So much like the legendary Beowulf, we too can risk the fight with our own Grendel and not be overcome. And doesn't that description summarize Superman and the fantasy he symbolizes almost perfectly? All-Star Superman shows us that through mastery of temperance, prudence, justice, and fortitude, he is able to complete one seemingly impossible test after another. But why Superman in particular stands above all other heroes as poster boy for the modern heroic archetype is, as also highlighted in the All-Star storyline, that the character of Superman shares many parallels with the protagonist in Plato's Allegory of the Cave, a story that centers around a set of prisoners who knew nothing of the real world except the shadows they saw on the wall. Having known only shadows their entire lives, the prisoners began to believe that there was nothing beyond these shadows, and that discovery ended there. They became content in their own ignorance, not only accepted, but relished in their own self-imposed limitations. That is, until one prisoner broke free and found his way out of the cave. There he discovered the real world in all its bright, colorful glory. He sees that the world he'd known had only been a mere shadow of the truth, a shadow of a greater existence, and a greater understanding. So how does this relate to Superman and his all-star storyline? Well, let's jump back to Lex Luthor's final defeat, and more importantly, what he says. This is how he sees all the time, every day, like it's all just us in here, together, and we're all we've got. Even the man possessing the colossal genius of Lex Luthor until that moment had been a prisoner staring at the shadows, unable to look past his own perceived understanding and rejoicing in the fact that he understood the shadows better than most. And even with Superman's powers, he could only see shadows until Superman showed him the way. But we also see in the All-Star storyline another harsh truth also presented in Plato's allegory. I saw how to save the world. I could have made everyone see. I could have saved the world if it wasn't for you.
says Luthor. To which Superman responds, you could have saved the world years ago, if it mattered to you, Luthor. In comparison, Superman stands as a significant parallel to the freed prisoner in Plato's allegory. Because Superman, more than most, is the hero who shows us the way, the man of tomorrow. Just as the escaped prisoner became enlightened and would eventually return to the cave to share his knowledge with those prisoners who remain behind, Superman has seen past the shadows. And like the great hero returning home from his journey, he returns to share his wisdom. Mainly because he actually has wisdom to share, instead of trying to peddle off meaningless shadows as enlightenment. And keeping that in mind, it's no wonder so many Hollywood elite look at Superman with the same dour expression the awkward nerd might give Chad, or Ray Palpatine might give Luke Skywalker. But Superman doesn't teach us through words alone. Just as My Hero Academia's All Might through heroic action inspired a young Deku to become a hero, and just as Deku would eventually inspire All Might to remember his own heroic ideal, Superman likewise shares his wisdom through inspirational acts, leading us out of the metaphorical cave through example. And by that example, he proves that it isn't about intelligence or power that allow us to see the greater existence. And it isn't genius or talent that makes Superman a beacon of inspiration. After all, Luthor was a genius and had gained all the powers of Superman, but it didn't make him a better person. It didn't make him. Superman. Superman is a living reminder that powers might make one super, but it's one's nobility that makes a hero. The fortitude to face hardship, the prudence to make the right choices, the fairness to put greater principle over one's selfish desires, and the discipline to remain temperate and in control despite possession of overwhelming power. These four cardinal virtues are things any one of us can practice and develop. As Superman shows us, no task is utterly impossible. Whether it be Lex Luthor, winner of the genetic lottery, or Deku, the ever popular loser of the genetic lottery, we already possess the potential to leave a positive mark on the world, a lasting legacy, to develop an expertise in all four cardinal virtues if it truly mattered to us. The catch, however, is that it takes work and dedication. It takes fortitude to face the possibility of failure and break from one's comfort zone. It takes prudence to know the right choices from the wrong. It takes a strong sense of fairness to remain just when your first impulse might scream revenge, and to properly empathize with those who may have wronged you. And it takes temperance to remain collected under pressure. In the words of Jor-El, the father of Superman, they can be a great people, Kal-El. They wish to be. They only lack the light to show them the way. If you were to listen to the women of Marvel or Zack Snyder, heroes like Superman have fallen from grace. The symbol that Superman became has been replaced by the vengeful Captain Marvel, the crazed Harley Quinn, or Batman. Or more specifically, Zack Snyder's Batman. Just like so many modern creatives, Snyder seemingly believes himself to be Plato's escaped prisoner. The enlightened man who has seen beyond the shadows and discovered the truth, and through his depiction of Batman, seeks to show us this truth. We are the dreamers content with shadows while Zack Snyder is the awakened philosopher. To quote, It's a cool point of view to be like, my heroes are still innocent. My heroes didn't lie to America. My heroes didn't embezzle money from their corporations. My heroes didn't commit atrocities. That's cool, but you're living in a dream world. And we've seen how Snyder's Batman recalls the innocence of dreams as a beautiful lie. We see how the sentiments of Snyder's Batman is of a man who has awakened to the cruel reality of the world, one where the smiling Superman could never exist. This is a Batman who had seemingly bought into the beautiful lie, where heroes are innocent and don't commit atrocities, and whose optimism had been gradually worn down until he was rudely enlightened to Snyder's world beyond the cave. But instead of light, he saw nothing but dark. 20 years in Gotham, how many good guys are left. How many stayed that way? But it isn't only through Batman alone that we see these nihilistic ideas, but through Snyder's Superman as well. All this time, I've been living my life the way my father saw it. Writing wrongs for a ghost, thinking I'm here to do good. Superman was never real, just the dream of a farmer from Kansas. Since Man of Steel onward, Clark Kent had been nothing but a pretender, a man studying medicine when he really wanted to be an artist, all to make his father proud. Snyder seems to scoff at the idea of the ideal Superman. So we get a Superman who snaps the villain's neck, a Superman who gives up, who abandons humanity, who has forsaken his legendary universal empathy, and who has greatly diminished all sincerity behind his heroism. Even when Lois Lane attempts to comfort Superman, and when Superman ties his heroic persona to his father's dream rather than his own, she doesn't contradict him or try to separate Clark Kent from Jonathan Kent, to potentially suggest that Clark Kent may reflect his father, but that the heroic nature of Superman is Clark Kent's and his alone. Instead, Lois says that farmer's dream is all some people have. It's all that gives them hope. Superman had just confessed that he'd become a hero for no other reason than to live up to his father's dream, saying that the idea of Superman only existed within that dream, but ultimately wasn't real. It's all been a lie. And Lois counters, 
by agreeing. Again, where Batman labels the optimism of his dream a beautiful lie, we see that the idealistic hero people believe Superman to be was another beautiful lie existing only in a farmer's dream. With Lois's argument being that maybe the heroic Superman really has all been a lie, but that Clark Kent should just continue the facade because people find hope in that lie. Superman's purpose then switches from optimistic, the enlightened hero burdened with leading humanity to a better future, to nihilistic, the sad pretender burdened with heroism. While most tend to remember the super of Superman and forget the man's humanity, Snyder has remembered the man but has forgotten what truly made him super, his nobility. For example, when Superman speaks with the vision of his father to gain wisdom or a reason to go on, we get this. Superman, did the nightmares ever stop? Jonathan Kent, yeah. When I met your mother, she gave me faith that there's good in this world. So, what does this mean? It means Lois tells Clark to continue the lie of Superman. It means that Clark Kent's heroic sacrifice is to knowingly continue living that lie for the sake of others. And it means just as Jonathan Kent needed Martha Kent, and because Superman is simply a role he plays instead of who he is, the character loses his heroic compassion. He no longer genuinely cares for humanity. Instead, Snyder's Superman, like Bill from Kill Bill, only has a selfish compassion, a compassion only for his loved ones, and so will continue to play the role for their sakes and continue defending humanity for their sakes. A change of mentality from what can I do for humanity to what can humanity do for me. And Bruce Wayne's dream of the future, which isn't as nice because it shows him reality instead of a fantasy, we see an outright corrupted Superman. Superman, she was my world, and you took her from me. Flash, Bruce, listen to me now. It's Lois. It's Lois Lane. She's the key. You were right about him. You've always been right about him. Going by what we see, Snyder paints a picture of a Superman turned murderous dictator because he lost Lois Lane, meaning that Lois Lane was Superman's connection to humanity, and when she goes, so does any shred of Superman's morality. Any reason to be heroic at all, and that Wayne's killer instinct had been right all along. Even Frank Miller's Superman was more compassionate than that, and he lasered off Green Arrow's arm. In other words, this Superman is less of a noble Deku and more of a Bakugo, needing a reason to help other than compassion or empathy. To summarize, in Zack Snyder's view, the iconic Superman was too perfect, his humanity completely incomplete without constant depression, smoldering anger, and destructive emotional outbursts. Oddly enough, this echoes the sentiments given by the women of Marvel, surprise surprise, when they praise villains for their struggle, their apparently unique potential for nuance and narrative freedom as opposed to the rigid cookie cutter good guys who just show up to punch the bad guy. If only Superman and heroes like him were less heroic, if only they lost their temper more, if only they didn't have the answers and made the wrong choices more, if only they crumbled under the strain of their own burdens more, if only they preferred payback a little more than empathy and justice, if only they were more like villains, if only they were us. When you listen to the overwhelming praise for villains and preference for scowling, howling heroes, these questions stop sounding like reasons at all and begin to sound like excuses. But excuses for what? We've seen through the struggle of Deku, through the smile of All Might, the twelve legendary labors of Superman, and practically every iteration of the hero's journey that not only do heroes struggle, but these struggles and the hero's victories over them are what we forge ordinary people into champions. And their assertions that villains have more potential for nuance and complexity, to quote, and for a long time too with villain characters, just in general, not specific to Marvel, they also had a lot of room to do things that were a little more nuanced and complicated than the cookie cutter hero characters because you get all this pressure for the hero to kind of stay in one lane. Again, describing villains as having a variety of makes and molds while the stuffy superhero supposedly comes in one single standard issue model. But where else could you find more nuance and complexity than exploring the contrast between Superman and Batman? As Michael E. Uslin, Batman film producer and comic scholar, yes, that job actually exists apparently, once said, Bob Kane was just a kid when he created Batman. He was just a teenager. It was the late 1930s. The comic book industry was brand new, but he had an interesting assignment. DC Comics was looking for a compliment to the first superhero they had presented, which was Superman. Superman. And to Bob, what made the most sense would be to go in the opposite direction and create a character who could be a superhero, but really based in humanity. But it's not that one hero struggles and the other does not. It's that the struggles of Superman are different when compared to the comparatively mortal Batman. Both heroes possess a strong sense of ethics and both are very physically capable, but their areas of vulnerability are different. While Batman's struggles might focus more on his physical limitations rather than his ethical ones, Superman's struggles focus 
focus more on his ethical limitations rather than his physical ones. Both characters are heroes after all, and they became heroic by overcoming their respective limitations. As said by Joseph Campbell, the hero, therefore, is the man or woman who has been able to battle past his personal and local historical limitations to the generally valid, normal human forms. The Injustice timeline, for example, and its depiction of a tyrannical Superman is exactly what might happen should Superman ever fail to overcome those ethical limitations, pushed too far, again, by the death of Lois Lane when the Joker sets off a nuke in the middle of Metropolis. Superman is unable to overcome this ethical obstacle, kills the Joker, and begins his reign of tyranny. To recall the words of the women of Marvel, with the villain it's like, no, you can have moments of softness and moments of doubt and all of these things, and then you're still the villain. Again, we see a downplay of characters like Superman and the ideals of traditional heroism. Heroes don't struggle enough. Heroes aren't complex enough. Heroes can't express themselves enough. Apparently, this means pillars of moral fortitude like Superman can only show moments of doubt, softness, and weakness by becoming a villain or forever casting aside his moral perfection. And in Justice, Superman seems to support these sentiments. And let us not forget that a more emotionally volatile Superman who loses control, who crumbles beneath the weight of his own burdens, who constantly doubts himself and snaps the necks of his enemies he isn't offering death threats to, was also the answer of Zack Snyder. However, contrary to what is apparently popular belief, Superman can fail and remain a model of ethical practice. In fact, we see this in Alan Moore's Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, a story in which, like the Injustice timeline, Superman fails in his role as a hero. By the end, Superman had lost nearly everyone he had cared about. Many of his friends and allies died helping to defend the Fortress of Solitude and one final battle against Superman's greatest enemies. Then we get to the final fight. The true mastermind reveals himself to be Mr. Mixaplik, a powerful entity from the fifth dimension. To quote Superman, Bizarro, the prankster, the toy man, Metallo, Brainiac, the kryptonite man, the legion of supervillains. There's only one name missing, isn't there? I know you're there, Mixoplik. Mixoplik had been responsible for the destruction of Superman's life until that point. Filled with rage and sorrow, Superman defeated his enemy by doing the unthinkable. To quote, torn in half between dimensions, he panicked when he saw the ray and made a fatal error, just as I knew he would. I killed him, Lois. I intended to kill him. I just couldn't risk letting anything that powerful and malignant survive. So I made up my mind and did it. I broke my oath. I killed him. At this point, Alan Moore's Superman might not seem too dissimilar from Snyder's Superman. After all, both versions intentionally killed their enemies out of necessity. But the difference is what happens next. Lois tries to ease Superman's guilt over his murder of Mexoplex. She offers Superman the same excuse Snyder uses to excuse Superman's murder of Zod. To quote Lois Lane, but you had to. You haven't done anything wrong. However, Superman doesn't accept that idea. And he responds by saying, Yes, I have. Nobody has the right to kill. Not Mixoplick, not you, not Superman. Especially not Superman. And what choice does Superman make? To again quote Lois Lane, as he walked into the blinding golden light, he turned and looked back over his shoulder. He smiled at me. I never saw Superman again. Superman had exposed himself to gold kryptonite, which permanently removes all of his powers. So while Snyder's more complex than nuanced Superman christens his career with a murder, Alan Moore's Superman ends his career with one. More Poor Superman knew that once he betrayed his oath and his role as a hero, he no longer believed himself worthy of his tremendous power. Superman had the fortitude to face a future without powers, the sense of justice to recognize his wrongdoing, the prudence to choose a suitable punishment, and the temperance to carry out said punishment. With a hero, you can have moments of doubt, weakness, and even failure, and then you're still the hero. Neil Gaiman's Whatever Happened to the Cape Crusader is all about Batman's many failures, his inevitable failures where he can't escape the death traps or when a lucky burglar delivers a fatal blow, when he can't overcome his mortal physical limits, the Batman dies. But here, Batman doesn't break his oath. Why? Because what made Batman the hero he became was not his extraordinary abilities, but his endless fortitude, his endless perseverance. To quote Batman, the end of the story of Batman is, he's dead. Because in the end, the Batman dies. What else am I going to do? Retire and play golf? It doesn't work that way. It can't. I fight until I drop. And one day I will drop. But until then, I fight. While Superman inspires us through his strong sense of justice and constant tests of temperance, Batman inspires us through his unwavering fortitude. In the words of Harvey Bullock, And then the floodwater hit like a battering ram and washed Batman away. And people said to me, How did you keep going? I said, Because he kept going. 
And there lies the true friction between the two characters and how they see the role of a hero. It isn't that they hate each other. These two heroes simply place their focus on different virtues. In fact, this is summed up quite well in the last exchange between Superman and Batman. Superman, I told him our job is to inspire them, to be better than they are so that they can be better than they are. And look at you, you're frightening them. You're as bad as the worst of them. He said no. Batman. No, Clark. I want to stand between the worst of them and the city. Superman. They've made a treaty. All of them. If I take you back to Gotham, they'll kill you. They won't stop until you're dead. And he smiled that scary smile. He said, and while they're trying to kill me, they aren't killing innocents. Now take me home. So I did. That was the last time I saw him. Superman surrendered his powers because the moment he betrayed his morals, his sense of justice, he stopped being Superman. He was compromised. In his view, a man who kills doesn't get to be Superman. And the same goes for Batman's fortitude. Batman is the hero who never stops, the man who keeps going when all others would not. But the moment he stops is the moment Batman dies. To quote Martha Wayne, you don't get heaven or hell. Do you know the only reward for being Batman? You get to be Batman. Both characters are written and have evolved into traditional heroes, not anti-heroes, and not villains. And yet they struggle. They're complex and nuanced. They have moments of weakness and doubt and failure. Superman meets every critique the women of Marvel offer as to why they identify with villains over heroes. Except Superman didn't have to lower himself. He didn't have to turn evil. He didn't have to stop being a hero. In other words, a hero doesn't have to be perfect. A hero can fail. Like Superman, a hero can even betray their ethics. But what separates heroes from villains is their ability to endure failure and then choose to make the difficult journey back to the moral path, whereas villains do not. In the words of the Greek philosopher Aristotle, you are what you do repeatedly. An honest man does not become a liar because he once lied. An honest man becomes a liar if he continues to lie. And likewise, a hero doesn't stop being a hero because they fail to be heroic. They only stop being heroes when they toss away their heroism. And keeping with the universal nature of Superman and the heroic archetype he represents, here's what Mark Hamill said on the topic of Disney's horrific depiction of Luke Skywalker, the hero of Star Wars. I said to Ryan, I said, Jedi's don't give up. I mean, even if he had a problem, he would maybe take a year to try and regroup. If he made a mistake, he would try to right that wrong. Right there, we had a fundamental difference. But it's not my story anymore. Under Ryan Johnson, the character of Luke Skywalker was given a similar treatment to Zack Snyder's Superman. To change a once hopeful, optimistic, and enlightened hero into a false idol. A grim, faithless iteration, a gutted, hollowed version of a much greater man. To once again quote Hamill, it certainly surprised me to hear Luke say it's time for the Jedi to end. I said, what? Luke was the most optimistic and hopeful character and I had a real, you know, sort of back and forth with Ryan. Hamill no longer saw Luke as the idealistic hero he was once written to be, just as so many no longer saw Snyder Superman or Batman as the superheroes they were written to be. Because our idea of a hero is deeply embedded in our psyche, our collective unconscious. To quote Cam for the symbols of mythology are not manufactured. They cannot be ordered, invented, or permanently suppressed. Through Deku, we've seen that heroes struggle. Through the All-Star storyline, we've seen that even Superman struggles. Through the contrast of Superman and Batman, we've seen that heroes aren't the cookie-cutter characters that modern creators claim. That even two noble heroes can be nuanced, complex, and as different from one another as any two villains. And through the story of whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow, we can see that a character like Superman can show moments of of doubt, weakness, and failure without falling into villainy, wonderfully demonstrating the bountiful narrative potential for stories and heroic adventures. So if Superman shares every trait that the women of Marvel claim draws them to villains, then, as mentioned before, these claims stop sounding like reasons and begin sounding more like excuses. But again, excuses for what? We might be given a big hint when the women of Marvel say this, you get all this pressure for the hero to kind of stay in one lane, because that's the moral character and the moral center of the story. So when you remove the similarities, we're left with only one clear difference as to why the women of Marvel identify with villains over heroes. Just like Snyder Superman is burdened by his heroic obligations, the women of Marvel are burdened by morality. The women of Marvel feel restricted by ethics, perhaps in the same way a tourist might feel restricted by a native language. It becomes pretty telling then that so many modern protagonists written by many modern creators, both villain and hero, have ranged from morally ambiguous to downright morally insane. So we 
get a Superman who destroys a man's truck and livelihood for being a jerk. We get a She-Hulk who actively defies justice so her client can get revenge. We get a Captain Marvel who assaults a man and steals his vehicle for, again, being a jerk. We get a spotlight on villains like Harley Quinn who, today, can sometimes be seen alongside the Justice League, but is still depicted as a murderous psychopath. As Poison Ivy says in the Harley Quinn cartoon series, you're a bad guy, but you're a good person. Keep in mind that this good person isn't opposed to gory displays of savagery nor violent conquest. To quote Harley Quinn, while you were out getting lunch, I was beating up an old lady to get a parademon army from another galaxy. To which Ivy responds, you really want to kill thousands of people just because? Ah, Harley Quinn, what a pretty petty paragon of inspiration. In Kingdom Come, Superman faces off against this very mentality. When the world claimed that Superman was a relic of the past and demanded more violent aggression from their guardians, the result was similar to what we see now in modern media. Heroes who aren't heroic and closer instead to idolized villains. To quote Superman, In our absence, a new breed of metahumans has arisen, a vast phalanx of self-styled heroes unwilling to preserve life or defend the defenseless, a legion of vigilantes who have perverted their great powers, who have forsworn the responsibilities due to them. In other words, going by what we've been given, it isn't that traditional superheroes like Superman are too perfect. Rather, modern writers like Zack Snyder and the women of Marvel don't know how to write characters who are morally sound. But why not? Prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, these are the virtues of which moral heroes are made. But there's one thing that true heroes have in common that villains aren't required to have. Discipline. Heroes represent selflessness, sacrifice, dedication. Villains represent self-indulgence. Whereas heroes push toward their goal, even at the cost of their immediate wants or most cherished desires, villains encounter temptation along their journey and fail to overcome it, choosing instead to indulge in their vices like a greedy hog. From Snyder's Superman to the romanticized Harley Quinn, these modern heroes ask the same question. Why be a hero at all? It's a reminder of the iconic line from Spider-Man, with great power must also come great responsibility. But what we essentially get from Zack Snyder, the women of Marvel, Ryan Johnson, and creators like them is an aversion or outright resentment of not only responsibility and discipline, but the maturity of character required to handle said responsibility. To summarize, they write like angry children, resentful of having already grown up. So we get heroes who throw emotional tantrums and act out of self-gratification rather than for the greater good. And the emancipated yet still murderously insane Harley Quinn is the ideal role model. Beautiful, quirky, and dangerous enough to satisfy almost any indulgence. Suddenly, we're pointed to the possibility that the people in charge of forging today's role models who are choosing characters written and characters idolized are the same angry juveniles who, like Peter Pan, have fallen in love with the idea of never growing up. To quote Leon the Professional, I'm old enough, I need time to grow up. The usual term for these kinds of individuals is pure eternus, or the eternal child. Joseph Campbell again provides a comment that highlights this exact idea. In the United States, there is even a pathos of inverted emphasis. The goal is not to grow old, but to remain young, not to mature away from the mother, but to cleave to her. Overall, terms like relatable, or realistic, or deconstructed are simply excuses for the creator's inability to comprehend the character of a moral character, or even comprehend the idea of a character who actively enjoys joys sacrificing for the greater good, who is fulfilled by things these creators may only see as unwanted burdens, unable to comprehend characters who are satisfied putting others before themselves, who understand the notion of giving rather than receiving, noble characters who simply love being heroes, creators so egotistical that they equate relatable character with good character and unrelatable character with bad character, the aforementioned mentality that heroes should be more like us instead of moral pillars for us to aspire to, because as a a master craftsman might pose a challenge for a student to one day reach or surpass his skill. A superhero championing all four cardinal virtues might pose a challenge for us to one day reach or surpass their nobility. So as a student might wish his master's demands were less demanding, perhaps the want for relatable heroes, i.e. the want for heroes to be more like us, rather than a want for us to become more like them, is a wish for the ideal Superman to be easier to reach, a yearning for a lower standard. The mentality of Zack Snyder's Superman and the women of Marvel, and so many other creators like them, is that of a rebellious child who
who believes the example set by Superman is too utopian, when it absolutely is not. In the words of Aristotle, if you hone your virtues every day, when the time comes, you will know what to do. But unfortunately for the pure Eternus, self-improvement takes work, discipline, and emotional maturity, something beyond selfish gratification, something unthinkable for the pampered eternal child who is not only content worshipping their childhood shrines, but rebels at any suggestion of doing otherwise. But this rejection of maturity and responsibility is not just something Joseph Campbell pointed out, though one might disagree on the value he places on story and myth. Even popular comedian Bill Maher pointed out this trend growing rampant in our modern culture. To quote, 20 years or so ago, something happened. Adults decided they didn't have to give up kid stuff, and so they pretend comic books are actually sophisticated literature. And because America has over 4,500 colleges, which means we need more professors than we have smart people, some dumb people got to be professors by writing theses with titles like Otherness and Heterodoxy and The Silver Surfer. And now when adults are forced to do things like buy auto insurance, they call it adulting and act like it's some giant struggle. And this brings us to the other possible reason why the idealistic Superman in particular is often dismissed. Why modern creators have fallen in lust with the imperfect, evil, or corrupted Superman. After all, there must be something for the rebellious eternal child to rebel against. Because as the man who shows us the way, a man compassionate enough to forgive while remaining stern enough to deliver discipline. A man who pushes us towards excellence could arguably be seen as a father figure for humanity. And as Campbell noted, the unfortunate father is the first radical intrusion of another order of reality into the beatitude of his earthly restatement of the excellence of the situation within the womb. He, therefore, is experienced primarily as an enemy. Stop bothering me, Dad. I don't want to play sports. While the mother is often seen as the nurturer, the father, like Mufasa to Simba, is often seen as the teacher. In fact, when speaking of the father, rites of passage are not too far behind. Rituals that symbolize the growth from child to adult. A journey of maturity and responsibility. To quote Campbell, the so-called rites of passage which occupy such a prominent place in the life of a primitive society are distinguished by formal and usually very severe exercises of severance, whereby the mind is radically cut away from the attitudes, attachments, and life patterns of the stage left behind. Normally, after a time of training and education, the child is torn away from the mother and thrust into life as an adult. Perhaps a more recognizable example might be a final exam. Final exams are usually taken at the end of the school year to determine if a student is ready to pass to the next grade. A few more notable examples from comics might be Samurai Executioner, with Yamada Saimon's execution of his father as proof that he's ready to take over the role of executioner. A western example might be found in Neil Gaiman's Sandman, where an elder tribesman initiates his grandson by telling a story traditionally passed down through the generations. To quote, When he returns to the tribe, he will truly be a man. He will have heard the tale at night. He will sleep in the young man's hut. In both instances, each rite of passage signifies that our protagonist has left childhood behind and has been granted passage to adulthood. Much like the elder tribesman to his grandson, the teacher to his student, or Yamada Asaiman's father to his son, Superman demands excellence from humanity. He knows the way and he teaches us by example. To paraphrase, Superman must be better than us so that we can be better than us. So when the women of Marvel say they relate to villains and reject the idea of the traditional superhero, when we break it down, their preference for morally questionable characters seems less like a necessary or enlightened choice and more like a rebellion against maturity. A refusal to better themselves, a refusal to leave the bliss of infancy and endure the rite of passage. As mentioned by Bill Maher, in a world burdened by adulting, one's worst enemy would be a figure like the ideal Superman, who demands they grow out of their infancy and whose very existence stands as a constant reminder of their failure. A constant reminder that a better world exists, but they lack desire to leave the cave and travel along their own hero's journey. And so they might understandably begin resenting heroes like Superman and feel closer to villains, because villains don't have such requirements. Villains don't demand better from those around them. The life of a villain is one of hedonistic indulgence. To once again quote the women of Marvel, you get all this pressure for the hero to kind of stay in one lane, because that's the moral character and the moral center of the story. I feel that we identify with villains because of their struggle. Very rarely today do we have a villain that is just cookie cutter. It's like, oh, you were traumatized and abused, and you were like, I'm going to reflect that back. Oh, I would never do that. But I feel that real deep. It would be a catharsis. I would rather see that story than the one where the person is like, hi, I'm a good person, and that's it. I'm going to punch the bad guy. Because choosing vice over virtue doesn't require sacrifice or maturity. And so, despite hearing having the same potential for variety, diversity, and story, the eternal child might choose villainy as a sanctuary, because villainy 
doesn't demand excellence. In the words of Superman, I'm here because the world's in bad shape. We have a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it in. I want you to join the League, willingly. Before you do, you should know that we have rules. Heroes act in a certain way. This isn't it. Those of you who take up with us, willingly, will be expected to be as responsible as you are powerful. You'll be expected to behave better. Those who don't will be dealt with. Our job is thankless, but we do what has to be done. Right now, we're humanity's only hope. Be heroes. Because modern creators, like most people, understand indulgence. They understand selfishness and pleasure. They understand characters like the villains and the vigilantes who oppose Superman. Eternal children who shy away from the maturity and the excellence demanded by Superman and selfishly indulge in their power. As Superman called them, a vast phalanx of self-styled heroes unwilling to preserve life or defend the defenseless. A legion of vigilantes who have perverted their great powers and who have forsworn their responsibilities due to them. As the creator of Bane and comics veteran Chuck Dixon pointed out, the problem that Superman has, and it's not really a problem, it's a problem for the creators, it's a problem for the writers. They don't know how to write good stories about a guy who is a boy scout, a guy who has a moral spine, a code of behavior. He's a gentleman. He's a paragon of virtue. They simply do not know how to write that kind of character and make it interesting. And the claim that villains have the freedom to be more complex because heroes are restricted by morality, and yet the roadmap is drawn. Even though it seems like a very tight set of restrictions, it's not. There's a lot of room in there to tell great stories. And on the topic that Superman is too powerful to be interesting, well, he has the power of a god. You know it's not interesting because how can you challenge him? Well, the writers in the 50s and the 60s certainly came up with plenty of ways to challenge him. And the idea of Zack Snyder that Superman must be changed or updated to produce suitable modern stories because Superman's powers, ethics, and ideals are not suited to his personal vision of how Superman should be? To this, Dixon says, I've been in that corner, and it was tough, and it was challenging. But I did it. I didn't whine and cry and change the rules just to write my version of Superman or somehow alter Superman to my quote-unquote vision. In the end, it isn't that Superman is a bad or impossible character to write for. He's just a more challenging character to write for. Just as the Riddler might require a little extra work to develop riddles and a criminally extravagant scheme to tie them to, Superman, too, requires extra effort along with a fundamental understanding of a character with, as Dixon put it, a moral backbone. So instead of embracing virtue themselves, they are content with taking virtue from those who have, those like Superman. And as we've seen with Captain Marvel, She-Hulk, and Harley Quinn, romanticizing and ultimately glorifying their vices. When creators attempt to convince us that our vision of the traditional hero is but an immature fantasy of a child, that abandoning the shining light of Superman will wake us from our dream world and enlighten us to the real one, the truth is that the opposite is true. Because following Superman means embracing discipline, maturity, and virtue. It means undergoing going the rite of passage and accepting the responsibility of adulthood. So instead, we get an outright rejection of these ideas and a denial that the virtuous idealistic Superman could ever be a reality at all. Maybe then it's no coincidence that so many new Marvel characters in the spotlight are immature teenage versions of adult heroes. But hatred for a character like Superman is nothing new. In fact, Plato explored this exact hatred in his allegory of the cave. Earlier, we explored how Superman could be seen as the escaped prisoner who ventured forth from the world of shadows into the real world and discovered a greater existence. However, when the prisoner decided to return to teach the other prisoners, the escaped prisoner's eyes had gotten used to the sunlight, and he could no longer see the shadows. And so, just as Superman is often mocked for being too naive, the escaped prisoner was also mocked for perceived lack of intelligence, and eventually threatened with death. But mocked or not, threatened or not, the prisoner returns to enlighten his fellow prisoners because he chooses to. Unlike Snyder Superman, who claims to be carrying out the dream of an old farmer, the prisoner returns out of a want, not an obligation foisted upon him by others. Superman became the symbol of justice and hope because of his actions. It wasn't a burden placed on him by others, but by his own compassion. To paraphrase Aristotle, he became what he consistently did. So maybe Superman, like All Might, smiles because he's a hero. Maybe Superman's smile was worn because he genuinely enjoys being a hero. Superman suffers, but for the sake of others, he will suffer gladly. And modern, egotistical creators from comics to Hollywood who believe dark, gritty realism starring fragile, neurotic heroes is the height of narrative sophistication have succeeded only in showing us shallow shadows while, like the prisoners in the cave, scoffing at a greater existence and writing it off as stupidity suited only for a dream world. To these creators, heroism, selflessness, and genuine sacrifice seem like concepts beyond their understanding or their willingness to understand. The legacy of Superman is one forged over time with great care 
care and love. In this regard, maybe Superman isn't too dissimilar from Batman. And as Frank Miller once said about the great Cape Crusader, he comes from a very dark beginning, but you don't keep doing something for that long because you're depressed. Maybe even when our heroes change from primordial beings to titans to gods and then to mortal heroes, it was indeed an evolution as stories and those who crafted them discovered the truth behind the ideal traits of the ideal hero. Stories which ultimately led Plato to theorize the four cardinal virtues. So when they say that the idealistic Superman is a relic from the past, a hopeful monolith of a bygone era, and that the real world Superman wouldn't smile and he wouldn't love being a hero in the dark reality of today, maybe the nebulous they have forgotten that Superman loves saving others, he loves protecting those in need, and he loves showing us the way. Also, Superman first stepped into pop culture in 1938 with Action Comics number 1. When was this more optimistic time exactly? Was it during World War II, when the world stood on the brink of being conquered by a genocidal maniac? Was it during the Cold War under the very real looming threat of nuclear annihilation? Is the world worse off now than it was back then? And if the answer is yes, wouldn't the shining light of hope shine even brighter in such dark times? Maybe superheroes were never meant to reflect the state of the world, but what it needs most. When asked what Superman represents philosophically, former Superman actor Christopher Reeve answered, A friend. And that's what people really need most. They don't need a strong arm vigilante force. They need a friend. Maybe then it might not be a surprise to learn that the thought of Superman as nothing but a tired symbol of the past is a lie. As recent as March 26, 2020, a poll showed that Marvel might be the most popular comic book company, but Superman took the crown as the most popular hero. So, is Superman still relevant today? As long as there are monsters to fight, as long as there are people in need of a friend, as long as people yearn for a better tomorrow, and as long as we need heroes, the icon that is the idealistic Superman has been, is, and always will be relevant. After all, in the darkest night, we will always need a shining light to show us the way.